Today on Larry King Now, actor and producer Elijah Wood on his new film, Set Fire to the Stars. It's set in 1950, New York City. There's something about the sort of film noir and the kind of movies at the time that were in black and white. Oh, they were. That sort of immediately transport you to, oh, I know where I am. I'm in, I'm in New York City. I'm in this sort of iconic movie space. On the death of his Lord of the Rings co-star, Sir Christopher Lee. He was incredible, towering both in, in size and stature and I think in personality. Plus. Now there's this thing where people are buying selfie sticks. Selfie stick? Yeah, so what to, does that do? it's a selfie stick so that you can put your phone on the end of a stick to take the best possible selfie. So your arm can only extend so far. It's ridiculous. It's all next on Larry King Now. For nearly 25 years, Elijah Wood has been delighting audiences. The once child star seamlessly ascended to adulthood with critically acclaimed roles in modern day classics like Sin City, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In his latest film, Set Fire to the Stars, Elijah embodies the week in the life of an aspiring poet in the 1950s as he embarks on a journey with his hero, the famed writer and poet, Dylan Thomas. Thank you, Elijah, for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. Is this Thank a true you. story or an imaginary story? Well, it's a true story. Um, it's, it's based on John Malcolm Brennan, who brought uh, Dylan Thomas to the States, wrote this book called Dylan Thomas in America. And the screenwriters, Kellen Jones, who plays Dylan Thomas in the film, and Andy Goddard, who directed it, basically chose this week, this first week, um, in that, that first trip to the U.S., and specifically, this sort of moment where John kind of scuttered uh, Dylan out of New York City because it was making him very unhealthy uh, and was a bad influence. He took him to this, this sort of boathouse uh, in northern Connecticut. Um, and there's only seven pages in the book that sort of make reference to this time. And it's very little information about what happened between the two of them. And they thought that that was sort of rife for the storytelling. Um, you play John. I play John Malcolm Brennan, yeah. And he's shot in black and white shot in black and white. Why in this modern day do a film in black and white? Well, I happen to love black and white. I do too. I think it's beautiful. Do kids like it though? Um, do we care? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think it was, for the filmmakers, it was um, for a lot of reasons. They described the fact that they only knew Dylan Thomas in black and white. I believe there are no known photographs of him in color. Um, and I think it also provides a visual shorthand. You know, it's set in 1950 New York City. There's something about the sort of film noir and the kind of movies at the time that were in black and white. Oh, they were. That sort of immediately transport you to, oh, I know where I am. I'm in, I'm in New York City. I'm in this sort of iconic movie space. Um, so that was kind of the reason behind it. What kind of poet was Dylan Thomas? He was, was he avant-garde? Was he? Uh... He was. He had a very unique voice. I I wasn't familiar with Dylan's work prior to the film, so the the script and ultimately working on the film really provided the conduit for me to get to know him, both as a poet and as a man. Um, but he was kind of the first rock star poet. He he really, you know, poetry has very specific rules depending on what kind of poetry you're writing. No and wasted he, words. He broke all the rules. <laughs> he didn't. None of them applied to him. And I think that's why his voice is still so modern. And he influenced a lot of people. I mean, Bob Dylan named himself after Dylan Thomas. Um, he had a, an outreach to the sort of avant-garde artists and to, to musicians um, that I think you know, sort of stands to this day. Do you like doing small independent films? I do. I love it. I mean, I, I don't... It's against the grain, though, isn't it? Today we have robotics and... <laughs> Graphics and yeah. computers and robots and right. Jurassic Parks. Yeah, it's, I think, you know, I'm not often looking to do large or small films. I'm just looking to do films that speak to me. And more often than not, they tend to be small independent films because the studios aren't, like you said, they're not making those movies. Is this the golden age of television? You were in Wilfred, right? I was, yeah. Yeah, um, had a great deal of fun making that show. It was a very strange show. Um, <laughs> it, I think it's the golden age of... of um, well, Netflix and all that. Yeah, it's the golden age of, of 
cable shows, I think, um, and certainly now we now have these, these other conduits for which we can tell stories with Netflix and Hulu and Amazon having their own shows. Um, it's, it's a glut of, of content, but it's where people can go to tell the stories they want to tell. They're incredible directors, writers, and actors who are moving to that space, probably because these kinds of things aren't being told you know, within the studio structure or, or within the context of films. And there's something about you know, eight episodes where you can tell a long form story that you can't really do in a film. Your production company primarily makes horror films, right? Yes. Why, why that uh, genre? Um, I have always been a fan of horror cinema. Um, for, uh, when we started the company five years ago, it felt like the kinds of horror movies that we love weren't being made in the US. They were largely being made abroad. And these kinds of films are the sort of horror movies where they don't rely solely on their exploitable elements or gore. They're relying on character and story, where in some ways you could take the horror element out of the film and you'd still have a compelling story. Things like Let the Right One In was made in Sweden, very much about you know uh, the friendship between two kids. It's a vampire film. but So those are the kinds of movies that we wanted to make. And I've always been a fan of the genre. I feel like it's a much maligned genre. I think it's misunderstood. Um, it's actually far more artful and interesting than people give it credit for. You have a forthcoming comedy horror film in which you star alongside Rain Wilson and Alison Pill, right? Yes. You have an action fantasy movie coming, co-starring Vin Diesel and Michael Caine. Michael's amazing. He is wonderful. You've done these films already? I have, yeah. Cooties, we finished two years ago. It premiered at um, the Sundance Film Festival, not this last year, but the year before. It's coming out in September. That's the, the horror comedy with Alison Pill and Rain Wilson. Uh, we produced it and I was also in it. It's hilarious. It's about a, a sort of zombie-like virus that affects children pre-puberty and turns them into savages. And it's about a group of <laughs> teachers who get stuck in the school. Um, and then the film with Vin Diesel and Michael Caine is called The Last Witch Hunter. And we filmed that last sort of fall winter. You started as a kid, didn't you? Yeah, I was eight years old when I started. That's yeah. why I thought maybe we'd met before. No, we had. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. We had. So you did your child star. Yes. Did the industry change a lot since you started? I think it's changed <laughs> immensely, yeah. I mean, I made a film about a year and a half, two years ago called Grand Piano, which was sort of a, um, a thriller in a very Hitchcockian style. And we were making the film, we made it in Spain, a Spanish director. When we were making the film, we thought, this is a movie that in the 90s would have been a studio film, but you wouldn't, a studio wouldn't touch this now. And I think that's one of the, the, the many small ways in which the, music, the, the, the film industry has changed, you know. One of your co-stars from Lord of the Rings, Sir Christopher Lee, mm. he lived into his 90s. 93 he? Yeah. he was, yeah. Died just days ago. Following the news, you were said, an extraordinary man in life led Sir Christopher Lee. He was an icon and a towering human being with stories for days. What was he like to work with? He was incredible. Towering both in, in size and stature and I think in personality. Um, was he the best Dracula? I think he was the most iconic Dracula, yeah. He certainly made it his own. Um, he was a fascinating person and he was lovely and it was incredible to get to know him. He was an absolute icon. Very and bright. Extremely bright and the, the life that that guy lived, I mean he was in the SAS, uh, he fought during World War II, he was a part of a, a secret division uh, that after the war was, was over, um, hunting Nazis, which is incredible. But he got associated with horror. Yes, very associated. I mean, he was one of the primary stars for Hammer Films out of the UK during the 60s. And now 70s. you have a DJ group called Wooden Wisdom. Uh -huh. These are uh, electronic DJ. What do you what do? You do? What I do play you do? vinyl. Um, my friend Zach Cowie and I, Zach has been a DJ for years, as have I, and, and we kind of uh, became close friends and realized that we had a, a shared love of very similar kind of music and that our musical vocabulary sort of complemented each other. And you play 1970s era disco records? Yeah, we play disco records, we play a lot of international music. Two of you. What's that? Two of us, yeah. Yeah, so we'll play... Duo discos. Kind of, yeah. We'll do threes occasionally, so I'll do three records, he'll do three records, and then we do one for one. And what ends up happening is we have this sort of musical conversation between each other. It's great. It's And you go all over the world. We, yeah, this. we just got back from, from Turkey and Italy and um, we were in Copenhagen as well. What led you into that? 
Well, I've always loved music. It's been a huge part of my life since I can remember. Um, and I guess 15 years, 16 years ago, I started DJing for fun, initially with CDs and then with iPods, because that was the sort of device at the time. You can carry so much music around. And I just love being able to express the music that I love to a group of people. Um, you know, it's, it's just a lot of fun to hear music you think is great and to see a reaction from the people that you're playing. So that's why I do it. You know. Is Set Fire to the Stars a line from a poem? It is. Um, and I'm going to be an idiot and forget the name of the poem that it's from. But it is. It's, a, it's a, one of Dylan Thomas's poems. And the John following him around is a poet? John Malcolm Brennan was a poet and a professor. Um, he basically convinced a, a, a group of, of professors to, to get um, Dylan to the U.S. And he was He's the one to speak sort of, at Yale. Exactly is that... to, to sort of set up a tour to essentially introduce the United States to Dylan Thomas. How many tour. people in the film? There are. I mean, it's Kel and I. Uh, for a great deal of the film, and there's probably five or six other actors. It's a relatively small cast. Last year you made a comment on the cultural trend of selfies. You said, <laughs> I'm so ready for the word to be taken out of our vernacular. Two years ago it didn't exist. Now it seems the only way people to reference a photo of themselves. Mm. It's so bizarre. I, why is it popular? Um, well, I think partly why it's popular is because we live in the digital age and, and when a, a phrase is coined or, a, you know, a new definition is coined, it tends to spread like wildfire and it gets adopted very quickly. Um, yeah, I find it an irritating word. Before you would just say, I'm, you know, it was a self-portrait and now it's this sort of selfie thing. But it's become so ubiquitous that people are confusing it for any photo. I've had people ask me for a photo where someone else is taking the photo with them and they're saying, can I have a selfie? So they're actually misinterpreting what it means. And now there's this thing where people are buying selfie sticks. Selfie sticks? Yeah, so what does that do? it's a selfie stick so that you can put your phone on the end of a stick to take the best possible selfie. So your arm can only extend so far. It's ridiculous. Short for selfish. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's also, you know, it, sh it showcases self that people this are very self-involved. I mean, if you look at a lot of people's Instagram uh, feeds, it's a lot of photos of themselves rather than capturing yeah, the world on. around them. Yeah. Now, speaking of selfish, how about selfless? You went down to Chile after the earthquake? I did, yeah. To do what? To visit some of the towns that had been affected um, and to sort of see what had been done and how much damage had been done and to spend time with the people there. Um, I'd had a prior relationship with a museum there in, in Chile, so that sort of was how I was invited to come down because I'd been to Chile and Santiago before. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Los Angeles. I was born in Iowa, um, moved to Los Angeles when I was seven years old, and I've been... Your there. eyes are bluer than blue, aren't they? That's They're... what people say, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen... I can't them. see it. I know, but I've never seen eyes quite as blue. Oh, Sinatra had eyes like that. Right. And Adelaide Stevenson. Blue eyes, wow. But they're incredible. Thank you. Do we play a little game of If You Only Knew? Okay. Okay? This I throw out. Fun. First girl you kissed. Um, don't remember her name. Ooh, that's bad. Uh, it was probably in first grade. It was in mm -hmm. Iowa. In Iowa? Mm -hmm. The role fans most approach you about? Frodo Baggins, Lord of the Rings. Your favorite role to date? Um, probably, uh, I, I play a piano player in a movie called Grand Piano, and it was maybe one of the most fun experiences making a movie I've ever Do had. you play piano? I did when I was younger. Um, not as well as the, as the particular person I played in the film, so it was a great challenge. So do they have someone play your fingers? For some of it, but what I found out after the, fin the movie was finished that it, uh, my hands represent about 80% of what you really? see in the film, which is, it kind of blew my mind. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Um, time travel, if and, that's a power. An actor or actress you'd like to work with? Oh, man. Um, you know what comes to mind in these past, uh, and it really broke my heart, was I, I never had a chance to work with Philip Seymour Hoffman. And he Whoa. was one of my favorites. He was one of those actors that I would, I would go to see a film because he was in it. A director you'd like to work with? Um, too many to list. There's a new director that I'm uh, currently in love with. He's got a movie coming out later this year called Green Room, called Jeremy Saulnier, and a movie called Blue Ruin that came out last year that I love. But, I mean, I love Ben Wheatley, uh, you know, the Coen brothers I'd love to work with, a lot of people. Pet peeve? Um, lack of consideration. 
when people think only of themselves and not about the people around them. That has, that manifests itself in many ways. A role you regret turning down. I don't know that I've ever had the, the pleasure of turning down something that I later regret. Uh, there are roles that I've gone out for that I didn't get, but I don't regret any of those things. Um, I always feel like the decisions we make in our life or, or even the, the opportunities that we miss ultimately lead us down the path we're meant to go on. So. You don't have to audition anymore, do you? Sure. Yeah, you do? Yeah. Oh. yeah. What genre are you most like to act in? Um, I don't know if there's a preferred genre. I, I, like, um, I like working on films that have a unique voice, so... Uh, you like different kind of films? Yeah. Like, yeah what what would you do if you weren't an actor? I'd probably... I would work in a creative field. I think it's in me. Um, music, probably. Music, music, or photography. I've always loved photography. A downside to fame. Um, I guess lack of uh, personal space. Favorite know. movie you were in? Um, one of them would be Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Uh, favorite horror movie of all time? That's a difficult question, but I would say The Exorcist was, is really certainly good. one of my favorites. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's a good example, I think, of a movie that is considered of a, of a high standard even outside of the genre of horror. Jonathan Miller wrote that, didn't he? he w William Peter Blatty wrote, wrote it, but Jonathan Miller, who starred in it. Did he write the The guy who got thrown down the stairs. Screenplay? I feel like Blatty wrote the screenplay, but I, I could be wrong. John, I, I, Maybe he wrote the screenplay. Maybe. Uh, the best thing about Hollywood. Um, wow. It, well, it, it, the best thing about Hollywood is that it, it on occasion, uh, creates great art that we will appreciate, f that, that is timeless, that we will appreciate for the, you know, Film for Film has that. It does. Worst thing about Hollywood. Um, at the moment, it's too financially driven, and it, it, uh, it, doesn't want to, it, it doesn't want to take risks. And your most cherished memory, young It man. also is very, Hollywood is very self-congratulatory as well. We need to ease, ease, on. ease off on the self-congratulations. Your most cherished memory. Oh, man. That's a difficult question. Um, some of my most cherished memories were the making of The Lord of the Rings for a variety of reasons. I think I was 18 when I flew to New Zealand. I spent the better part of four years in New Zealand and I made some of the best friends of my life and I changed from a, a child to a man over the course of Was it a tough years. shoot? Very hard, yeah. How do you stay out of tabloids? I actually think it's remarkably easy. Um, I lead a relatively banal life in regards to what they would think is exciting, so I think that's part of it. You're not married? I'm not married. Um, Do you date anyone in the business? I don't, or I haven't in a while. Um, so maybe that's part of it. But I also, I don't go to the places where those, the sort of paparazzi and those people tend to hang out. Um, Do I papara paparazzi quiet. bother you? On occasion, I, sometimes it's unavoidable. You know, they hang out at airports. They, yeah. They'll find out what flight you're on, things like How that. How do they do that? I don't know. They have a, a quite an intense network. What restaurant you're going to? Sometimes. And but some I, people call them and say, I'm going they, to this. They do, which is- <laughs> That's really self -taught. Terribly rude. Um, but I also think it's easy. I go out, and, and on a daily basis, I go out and I don't think anything about where I'm going or what I'm doing. And if I run into it, I run into it. But more often than not, I tend to sort of stay away from What it. age did you come here? I was eight, eight years old. Was your father in the business? No, nobody was. All right, we have some questions from fans on social media. Okay. Jo Jordan Cameron on Twitter. What's your greatest fear as an actor? As an actor? Henry Fonda told me not having a script to read. Oh, God. That's a good one. No matter how famous you are, he said. That would if you be don't have a script, that it's would, over. That would be terrifying. <laughs> um, I have anxiety dreams when I'm working about not remembering my lines. Um, so not being prepared, I think. Brandy um, McGee on Facebook. How did you manage to avoid the pitfalls that other child actors have faced? My mother having a solid foundation as a human being first. Um, and, a, and a realistic perspective about what this movie industry is. 
Gavin Reynolds on Twitter asks, if there's a role you turned down that in hindsight you wish you'd taken. Yeah, I'd never turned anything All right. down. The roles you tried out for that you didn't get, Yeah. what was the one that you said, I, oh, that hurt? I tried out for Rushmore, and I had, I had been a big fan of Wes Anderson's first movie, Bottle Rocket, because at that point, he, that's the only movie he'd made, but I loved it. My brother and I could quote the film, so I went to that audition with a great amount of excitement just to meet him, because I, I was such a fan of what he'd done with Bottle Rocket. Um, and I loved the script for Rushmore, and it happens to still be one of my favorite movies. I'm kind of glad that I didn't do it, because we wouldn't have the performance that Jason did so beautifully. Bush Door Hill via the Larry King Now blog. What was your favorite game to play on Super Nintendo? <laughs> oh, taking me back. Um, there's a game, I loved all the Super Star Wars games. Those are probably my favorite. Scott Steinholm on Twitter. We've learned so much about the universe since Deep Impact came out. Do you worry about a comet hitting the Earth? I don't. I don't. I think anything is possible and anything can happen, and we're at the mercy of, of the cosmos. So I don't, I, don't, um, I don't occupy my mind with fear about the possibility of that happening. Uh, Sanj Sanjan Van Bulke via the Larry King Now. You once said you prefer an independent girlfriend. Yes. Uh, how independent are you? I'm independent. I've, I have a lot going on in my life. Um, have you ever come close to getting married? No. Not to getting married, but I've certainly been in love and... How many times have you been in love? Maybe only a couple. Not many. Tragically end? None of them have tragically ended. Um, there have been relationships that have ended that I've been disappointed that they ended, yeah. And Graham Hart on Twitter, any update on The Greasy Strangler? <laughs> what, what is that? The Greasy Strangler is a film that my production company, SpectreVision, is producing. So it's a movie I'm producing that we just finished. Horror? Um, difficult to describe. No. The strangler it, has grease on his hands and he fails. His whole body. He's falling. Oh. His whole body. Uh, he's, a, he's covered in grease. So it's got horror elements. It's about a serial killer. Um, it's made by a filmmaker called Jim Hosking, who's a, a British filmmaker. It's his first feature, but he's been doing shorts and commercials in Britain for a long time. Um, it's a strange piece. It's about a father and son. It's very funny. It's disturbing. Um, and it should be hopefully out later this year or early next year. How do you rate Silence of the Lambs? Oh, Silence of the mm -hmm. Lambs is a masterpiece. Elijah, great man. Larry, thank you. I want to thank my guest, Elijah Wood. Set Fire to the Stars is in select theaters now, and you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. I'll see you next time.